This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Dr. Huang Huyen is the co-founder and vice president of BlindLink, a social enterprise based in Vietnam that provides employment, support, and training opportunities for people with vision disabilities. Prior to BlindLink, Huang was the director of the Macroeconomics and Strategy Department of the Development Strategy Institute, a national-level think tank in Vietnam. Huang is currently a Rajawali Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. She was also a Humphrey Fellow as part of the Fulbright Program. She received her PhD in Economics of Development from the Development Strategy Institute in Vietnam. I spoke with Huang in Cambridge. Hello, Huang. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Where am I calling you today? I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm a visiting fellow in the Art Center of Democracy and Government Innovation, Harvard Kennedy School. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I hope that it's not too cold in uh, Cambridge today for you. Oh, no, it's not cold at all. (laughs) We haven't seen snow yet. The weather is very nice. Yeah, to me. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm I'm interested in learning what your fellowship is about, but we're here to talk about bl- the organization that you helped to co-found, BlindLink. Tell me, what is it that you do for BlindLink, and uh, what's your position or your role? And tell us about that organization. What does it do? Currently, I am co-founder and vice president of BlindLink Vietnam, an initiative presented from my Humphrey Fellowship in 2012, that fellowship funded by the U.S. government. And we, Humphrey Fellows, are very proud of uh, our certificates with signatures of both U.S. President and the Secretary of State. And BlindLink is a nod for profit social enterprise providing employment support and training opportunities for Vietnamese people with vision disability who accounts for nearly 4% of total population or nearly 4 million of people. And our main idea is to employ the social entrepreneurship to help the blind and its, its core business is the massage service done by the blind. How did you choose the core service to be a massage service? I think I you know explain the whole picture first. Oh, okay. That's great. Perfect. Yes. I I think first, many people ask me why I am helping working with the blind people. The the first reason is that in developing country with 90 million of population and of which 55 million of people participating in the workforce and we have very high rate of unemployment or underemployment like Vietnam, the most concern of our disadvantaged people is to have a job. And I think it's also the most important target when designing professional training programs. So that's why we focus on creating employment and provide social training programs so that they can become qualified workers. Massage therapy has been one of the best jobs for not only in Vietnam, but also in Asia for hundreds of years because it is something they can be trained to do and they have a natural affinity for doing it very well. Unfortunately, training in all aspects of the profession receives very little financial and technological support from the government or other resources. Therefore, in terms of a career option, its major disadvantage are first, being a master provide providing them very low and unstable income. A blind master working in Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, receiving on average about $1.7 per 60 minutes of massage treatment. That's because they are working in the low-end market segment. The majority of clients are low-income class and the parlors have poor facilities. And at the same time, they have very long working day, usually starts at 9 a.m. and finishes at 2 to 3 a.m. early morning next day. And and second, their job is not highly regarded even by themselves and their families due to the poor image associated to the massage industry in Vietnam in general. The common perception is that massage is highly related to prostitution and so they are highly exposed to physical or sexual abuse by clients. Our survey of less than 100 young blind massagers revealed that on average, 20 to 30% of their clients did have sexually abused them. 
So in short, it's not a desirable job for our blind people. They often have to do it because they don't have another choice instead of they really want to do it. And most of our blind female masters will choose to get rid of this job if they can reach another work with lower income. So BlindLink is trying to help our Vietnamese blind young adults by providing them trainings and trying to transform the image of blind masters. And we think that the first time in our history of 100 years living by doing masters, our blind masters can confidently step out into the sunshine by working in a high-end massage parlors like our Omamori spa chains. And we not only providing them good income, but also giving them high regards by clients and they feel proud of themselves. Mm. And you personally, yes. why, why did you pursue BlindLink as a, you know, an organization to create rather than a commercial organization or something potentially more profitable? Why was this so important? Frankly speaking, I had never thought that I would launch an impact-driven organization before going to the U.S. in August of 2012. I was a kind of active person. I achieved a secondary student table tennis championship of Hanoi Capital and the National Chinese Chess Championship. I was the founder of English Economics Club in the National Economics University. And I also get involved with my friends Mike and Chung when they tried to set up an NGO to have street kids in Hanoi in 2002. That organization then named Blue Dragon and now very famous in Hanoi. And Mike was named one of CNN heroes in 2011. So I did have some experience, but I never thought that I would launch any social sector organization because I believe it is very difficult for local residents to set up and run an NGO sustainably. And we don't have expensive network and experience to reach international grants and private donations. Our country has uh, entered the lower middle income group with the average income per capita that's nearly $2,000 per year. So no, NGO is a kind of very luxury activity for us to run. And most of NGO in Hanoi are a branch of international organization founded by foreigners who didn't come back home to raise funds. And the second reason is that oh, yeah, we still have some concerns about NGO's efficiency and impacts. However, when I participated in a trip named Experience Theater, hosted by the Humphrey Fellowship Program uh, placed in Un University of Washington in 2013. The first time I heard about the concept of social entrepreneurship that is there, immediately I felt in love with it. I love the way people in Seattle using the business mindset to social issues. So that's in Seattle where I found a feasible solution for me, a local resident in a developing country, proactively solve our social issues instead of waiting for the government or international NGO to deal with it. And I, as a mid-ranking government officer in the Ministry of Planning and Investment in Vietnam, I also have serious concerns on efficiency of public expenditure to tackle social problems. This is not about increasing or reducing public expenditure, but rather about helping the government to do more with the money it has. So I have both micro and macro vision when doing this project. And I mean, when running BlindLink, I can have people, particular, particular disadvantaged people, by empowering them or with our training programs and giving them good jobs. Uh, at the same time, I have intensive experience to participate effectively in policy formulation process as a government officer. You, you found that social enterprise was something that excited you and you, you helped create BlindLink. How do you measure the success of BlindLink's work? Yeah, sure. That is a big, big question, right? And I think that let's start with the blind master before joining BlindLink. 
uh, before joining Blylink, uh, I tell you that uh, they have yeah, low income. They work in low low income segment in a poor facility uh, parlor, and every day they only do massage and then they will go to sleep. So that's basically the life. And with uh, the model in Omamui Spa, we first after the my visit to Seattle. I invest $25,000 as seed capital from personal saving and Omamori Spa target international tourists and expats living in Hanoi as well as Vietnamese upper middle class. You see a small size but high-end massage parlor. Um, that segment of clients our blind master have never worked with before. And too many people, my idea seems crazy because there is a huge gap between the standards of services demanded by the targeted clients and the actual capacity of our blind muscles. Real muscles is considered as an art and as our Canadian re resistor therapist volunteer with us there, fill up art and she, as she can't play piano or draw so she learned massage. So massage is really very superior service because each client is very unique. And even a client who comes to the spa this week might be very different next week. And clients who spend for massage treatment, usually because they feel stressful or tired, both in terms of spirit and physical body. And after 90 minutes of massage treatment, the client wants to feel like a new person. As they often say, we felt like we were walking on the air when we left. So in the meanwhile, our blind people, though in theory, they have gifted hands a great potential to do this service. But in practice, only 8% of them are educated by schools and 50% provided vocational training. In Vietnam, we have only one vocational training and rehab center for the Vietnamese blind coming from the whole country. So though our black people, most of them living by doing massage, they have never heard about the popular massage mo modalities favored by Western clients, such as the uh, 3Ds or hostel massage. They only do a kind of acupressure ones, but it is or far from the service you can consider as an art. However, now Omamori Spa made its top three best spas in Hanoi according to the chief advisor. Thus, one year scene is open. And more importantly, by the end of October 2014, we provided approximately 3,500 services and 95.5% of our clients' feedback are good and excellent and 60% of clients are foreigners, 40% are Vietnamese, and in this winter, 80% of our clients are foreigners, mostly Western tourists and expat community in Hanoi, and we use evaluation uh, feedback card for each service our blind muscles do, and we monitor both feedbacks on their skills and working attitudes. So thus, after one year, our clients uh, generally recognize that Omamui Spa's positives are first, muscles are skillful, attentive, amiable, and polite. And second, nine ambience and massage in a quiet room. And the third one is inexpensive. We are providing the high qualified service at the cheapest price. Consider a uh, compare to the same service quality and facilities uh, in Hanoi, just $7 per 60 minutes. And we adopt no tips. In other places, usually it will cost from 12 to $28 for the same service quality. And, and finally, they think that they choose her because you know, they support for good cause. Those are fantastic statistics. The, the yes, organization yes, is clearly yes. delivering. And our blind master have income on average 50% higher than blind masters working in other places, given the same skills and years of working experience. They have a shorter working day because we normally close at 9 p.m. comparing to like 3 a.m. the next day. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, in other blind masters parlor. And uh, 
as I said, yeah, they also exposed to learning environment uh, because we uh, adopt a kind of mandatory training program organized every morning in the spa. And then we teach them in conversational English to communicate to clients and uh, um, master's continuing education and entrepreneurship education and living skills. So I, I think that uh, that's something we, we do. And at the same time, we not only provide training programs for free for our staff, but also for the community at last. So in total, there are 299 students and Romans and beneficiaries from all programs, including the YKIN program. So with these types of results, is the spa self-sustaining? Does Do the clients sustain the work? financially? Yes, yes. We reached the break even point in August this year. Wow. So, in one in one year then I, congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I don't have to worry about financing for the loss now, yeah. It's it's really a burden for me because we unlike other organizations don't rely on grant or donation and uh, didn't receive any government subsidy. Wow, that, that, yeah, that's that's powerful that that you've chosen a service that is able to self-sustain in such a short amount of time. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why I love social entrepreneurship. That's why I love this model. Sure. It should be by itself. Yeah. Is there any one story that you could tell us that is something that has surprised you, either about the trainings or about the massage work or about one of this one of the practitioners or students? that you like to tell? Oh, yeah, so many. And one of our successful stories is a guy living in the rural area who graduated from college and working for Honda Vietnam is a branch of the world's largest and leading manufacturer of motorcycles until he was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2009 after three surgeries. He personally lost his vision and his memory was not functioning well either. So he, he has both problems, vision impairment and memory dysfunctioning. Mm. He could remember things people just told him the previous minute. So he stayed at home to do housework for four years and absolutely isolated from society until October 2013 when he heard about blind Link free massage training course. And the first day when I met him and his father, he could barely speak a word because his brain didn't function the way he wanted it to. So it took him three times longer to complete the course compared to other visually impaired trainees due to his memory problems. And we had to adopt a very special method to teach him the massage skills. And in fact, among five students of that course, he had the most serious problem. But finally, this guy is the only trainee completes the course separately because he <laughs> has very high determination, very high determination. Everybody was touched by his efforts and tried their best to help him. When I did this project, I had opportunities to work with many people with disability and without disability. And very soon I understand that your own efforts is the most important factor of success. Many people, though, enjoy favorable conditions, just don't try their best and give up when they just start. So that guy, finally he graduated and became a full-time master at Omamuri Spa in July uh, this year. In addition, thanks to his daily communication with his roommates and staff, he had regained his speaking ability. Wow. Now he can speak no problems at all. Yeah, really, it's amazing, you know, like a miracle. And he even can make jokes. He has good <laughs> income now and, and because his master skin is very good. However, he still faces a lot of difficulties in learning English. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's really in, yeah, an inspiring story. That is definitely an inspiring story. That's amazing. So let's focus a little bit on how you run this organization. You're in Cambridge right now. The organization is in Hanoi. Yeah. What tools are you using to help run the organization? Are you 
active on a daily basis now or is it being run by other people or how have you set things up so that it can continue to function? That's a, a big question. I didn't um, apply any special tool. As many people, I mainly rely on technology when I arrived in the U.S. in August this year. I had received the admission to do research in Harvard Kennedy School before I launched this project. So I already know that I will have to plan for a big break. And at the same time, I understand that I have to empower our visually impaired young adults so that they can stand on their own feet. So in the first three months last year, I worked full time to set up the system and provided them trainings or I participated in the training programs. I lie down as a model and to, and, and they practice uh, massage to encourage, encourage them. I also have to develop the manual to teach them from A to Z, from the sentences they should learn to speak to clients on phone to the sentences the master will communicate to clients while doing massage. We use the checklist to make sure that the spa is always well organized so everything should be very detailed and very simple so that they can follow. One example, in the first three months, I made flower arrangement in the spa. Very soon, it looked really nice and the clients liked it. Uh, but very soon, I found that people, nobody care about flowers and it needs to be replaced. And they also cannot make flower arrangement when I am away from the spa. So I came up with a decision to replace the natural flowers with handmade Japanese clay flower, a Jane aesthetic of Ikebana flower arrangement. And the most important here is to defy all the necessary roles and carefully outline responsibilities and desire performance by pay system so that everybody will try their best to fulfill their roles Yes, which permit the business run smoothly without my everyday involvement. Mm. So that was in August. That was yes. four, four months ago. Mm. How how has it continued to run without you? So that, then I step up my time away gradually, and finally it could run without me after six months of operation. I don't have to involve with uh, daily work, but I participated in. I fo- mainly focused on the training programs. And since August, I I came here. So I work with them online. Uh, they send me the report, uh, the the business every day, and I have to say that they did the job very well. We reached the highest number of clients in August. And the, yeah, the month that I I left. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the month you left was the most clients. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and and yeah, we did much better than the yeah the the previous months sure. <laughs> yeah for for uh, four recent months so now you're you you've created a system with this social yes. enterprise and you are doing a research fellowship right now what does yes. the next 5 years look like for blindlink or and for yourself will you will you franchise the organization will you, what will you continue to participate what what do you think the future looks like we would like to reach 2 million dollars in revenue by December 2020. So I have in my hand the plan to skin up our project. Currently, I'm seeking to raise $100,000 to achieve impact on a significant scale. And social impact investors will receive their return while blindling commits to use its profit proportion to achieve its vision and missions. Yes, we, we do have that plan. Mm. And have you you've already put that plan out on the market and you're you're shopping it around or are you still creating it? I just finished creating it uh, and just start talk to uh, one organization step by step. I think so because uh, I really need to learn a lot to then I can uh, understand the way social venture investor here thinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure. To, to persuade them invest in Omamuri Spa. Hong, one question I ask everyone uh, who's a guest here on the show is, when have you failed and what did you do to recover from that failure? Every entrepreneur entrepreneur knows that it's not all smooth sailing. 
So what, what was one of the biggest difficulties you faced and how did you overcome it? That's very interesting questions. I have to admit that Omar Murisbar faced serious uh, challenges our greatest challenges, uh, in fact, uh, two times, and and own and both two times relating to the employee turnover. Thus, imagine six months after the staff completed all kinds of training programs, and they can work without you, and suddenly half of them quit the job because of many reasons. I was shocked, really, in March this year. I was shocked and I just don't understand why. But it, it's just simply that, like that. We provide them good income, good working environment. Everything seems so good comparing to the current situation in other places. But it's, it's just simply like that. So I think that is the main reason why we still don't have a professional massage industry. Employees turnover made many other spa and massage parlors close down and and, and usually the masters are rule makers instead of the owner. At that time, I adopted the management system similar to, to, to the one I adopted in my department in the government sector. I believe that if you provide them good income, they will work with uh, high productivity. And so we should not hire uh, so many people. But, but that kind of model doesn't work. It failed totally. So the incident made me change the way we recruit and compensate our blind masters and staff. And then I adopt a multi layers of backup employee at reasonable cost thanks to Blindlink's training programs and abundant resource of qualified young volunteers who are university students and can work part-time with us. Currently, we have eight full-time employees on our disposal, working with 10 part-time staff. And we have total nearly 12,000 working hour volunteer. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> they, yeah. And they, your, goal, your goal, you said, is 200, 2 million U.S. dollar turnover in 2020. Is that correct? Yes, yes. What's the annual turnover of the spa now? So now is fifty thousand, but this is a small size. Is it a, a small size bar with only five beds? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, and we haven't uh, done any marketing yet. In fact, I, I don't think that a small size Omamui spa now can create a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, it does a pilot model. Yeah, it worked well, and 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 to make money, we must create a much bigger one, the last size and high high end one. And we haven't uh, got any place day spa like that uh, to host uh, tourists and uh, expats living in Hanoi. One final question for you, Hong. Yes. You've given us the story about how you decided to become a social entrepreneur and how you were inspired and some of the challenges and successes that you've experienced. What advice would you give to people who are listening to this show about how to either create a social enterprise or become a part of the development and aid workspace that you've experienced that you think is important for success? I think it's, uh, there is a very old saying, try the best to do what you love and the rest will come. And I would like to quote Kristen Day, CEO of Louvre's advice, there is no evidence for what has not been created yet. Only insight, purpose, passion, and a willingness to move into what could be instead of what is. That's my advice. Wow, that's, uh, that's powerful. <laughs> I think we'll leave it right there. Huang, thank you so much for this interview today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Stefan. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes.